Welcome to Genova Diagnostics. This presentation will cover specialty diagnostics for nutritional assessment, specifically focusing on the organics comprehensive profile. Hi, I'm Stephen Goldman, part of the medical education team at Genova Diagnostics. The objectives for this presentation are to understand how organic acids may be used to provide unique clinical insight to review the sections of the organics profile, to present a clinical case with treatment considerations utilizing the organics. What are organic acids? Organic acids are metabolic intermediaries involved in many biochemical pathways, including energy production through mitochondrial function, toxic exposures and detoxification pathways, neurotransmitter metabolism, production by gut microbiota, vitamin-dependent pathways. They are commonly measured through first morning void urine collection. Organic acids are not nutrients, but do have nutrient precursors, like amino acids. The organics utilizes functional recommendations for B vitamins. So what's the difference between a direct measurement of a vitamin and a functional recommendation? In a direct measurement of an analyte, such as B12, we would utilize a blood sample that measures the level of B12 and then compare that level to a reference range. In a functional recommendation, we look at various markers that depend on B12 as a cofactor and then determine whether there is a need for B12 support. Functional recommendations utilize an algorithm to determine the level of nutrient support. Sticking with our B12 recommendation example, why not measure vitamin B12 in serum? Well, several studies have suggested that the determination of serum or urinary methylmalonic acid could be a more reliable marker of cobalamin deficiency than direct cobalamin determination. This comes from the Mayo Clinic uh, Interpretive Handbook of 2019. In other words, one can look at B12 as a direct measure in a reference range. On the organics, we'll look at markers such as methylmalonic acid, where an elevation of methylmalonic acid determines that there's a need for B12. Here's a study indicating that urinary methylmalonic acid is a great early indicator of vitamin B12 deficiency. It states that it can be recommended that urinary methylmalonic acid alone has better diagnostic efficiency in diagnosing vitamin B12 deficiency. So how does that work? We begin with isoleucine, valine, odd-numbered fatty acids. Those are the nutrients that lead to the production of methylmalonate. Methylmalonate conversion requires vitamin B12. When B12 levels are low, methylmalonate levels in the blood become elevated. The elevated blood levels are then dumped into the urine, showing elevations on first morning void testing, like on the organics. So those elevated levels support a functional need for B12 support. The organics comprehensive profile urine, overview and clinical indications. Let's take a look at the various sections of the organics. We'll get into each of these individually as we go further into this presentation. This is a front page with a summary of abnormal findings. These nutrient markers, fatty acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, energy production, really are about energy production through the citric acid cycle. Nutrient markers for B complex vitamin needs, neurotransmitter metabolism markers and oxidative damage and antioxidant markers toxicants and detoxification, and then compounds of bacterial or yeast fungal origin. The final page provides various recommendations and ranges for nutrients as indicated in the test findings. The organic acids are laid out by category. So we take the organics and categorize it through the Krebs cycle revealing mitochondrial dysfunction, those related to vitamin dependent pathways, those related to neurotransmitter metabolism, and elevations due to toxic exposures and detoxification pathways. 
also those that are produced by the gut microbiota. Here's a summary of the abnormal findings front page. Biomarkers include a listing of various categories for each marker. So if you look at that box on the left, you see fatty acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. Just looking at that, you see fatty acid adipate and suberate as an example. The findings are a listing of the measured levels. You see borderline high, borderline low, high or low. The metabolic pathway describes the specific pathway impacted by the finding. We said the adipate and suberate as fatty acid metabolism biomarkers, here both borderline high, and the metabolic pathway that they're involved in is fatty acid oxidation. Let's take a closer look at the findings for adipate and suberate. Notice that they're both borderline high. Not high, but borderline high. Both involved in fatty acid oxidation. If we look at how it's listed on the test, the adipate and suberate both have quintiles, 20% breakdowns, five 20% increments. Notice also the red on the right hand side would be the fifth quintile, the highest 20% of the population for the reference range. So for adipate, anything at 6.2 or greater would be at least in that fifth quintile, borderline high. But the reference range is 11.1 or less. The finding of 8.5 is still in the reference range of 11.1 or less. Thus, it's a borderline high. It's in the fifth quintile. If the adipate had been greater than 11.1, it would have just been recorded as high. The same for the suberate. At 2.9, the 2.1 threshold gets us into the fifth quintile, but the reference range is 4.6 or less. Anything greater than 4.6 would have been high, a red H. But in this case, at 2.9, we're in the fifth quintile. We're calling that borderline high. Let's interpret the carbohydrate L-lactate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Here for L-lactate, we have a red H. L-lactate, part of glycolysis, and beta-hydroxybutyrate, ketone production. So we have a high L-lactate. So right away I know we're past the reference range. So looking at the listing here for lactate, there's your red H. The finding was 19. To get into the fifth quintile, 8.5 or greater. But we're well past that because the reference range is 0.6 to 16.4. Anything greater than 16.4 is greater than the reference range. And thus the L-lactate is high, not borderline high but high to the reference range. The Krebs cycle is fueled by macronutrients. Fats as fatty acids, carbohydrates through glycolysis, proteins through amino acids, they fuel the cycle in the mitochondria. The organic acids are the intermediaries in the cycle that can provide insight into imbalance. Nutrient cofactor support can influence organic acids. These are the Krebs cycle markers from the organics. Fatty acid metabolism elevations suggest the need for carnitine and B2. Carbohydrate metabolism reflects glycolysis, the breakdown of carbohydrates to pyruvate and lactate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is a ketone body. When we see a ketone body elevation in the urine, we have to ask certain questions. Is it a ketogenic diet? Is the patient on a low carb diet? Are they catabolic and breaking down their own muscle? Are they diabetic or pre-diabetic? Those are all questions that one has to evaluate. Citric acid cycle levels suggest possible nutrient cofactor needs. Looking at this energy production citric acid cycle section from citrate all the way through hydroxymethylglutarate, we're getting a sense of those organic acids and any imbalances that may lead to a recommendation around B-complex, CoQ10, amino acids, and magnesium as indicated on the page. This section of nutrient markers is B-complex vitamin markers. 
The B-complex vitamin markers indicate possible needs for B1, B2, B3, 5, 6, and biotin. Let's take a look at the B-complex vitamin markers. Elevations of alpha-ketoisovalerate, alpha-ketoisocaproate, alpha-keto-beta-methylvalerate, as indicated in the red above them, are a need for B1, B2, B3, and B5 functional recommendations. An elevation of xanthoranate is specific to a B6 need. You need B6 to break xanthoranate down. With inadequate B6 functionally, you'll see an elevation of xanthoranate in the urine. Beta hydroxyisovalerate is associated with biotin need. Under methylation cofactor markers, we look at methylmalonate, as we discussed in an earlier slide. Elevated methylmalonate is associated with the need for B12, whereas an elevation of formiminoglutamate or FIGLU is associated with the need for folate. Since B12 and folate are such key cofactors for methylation, they're under the heading of methylation cofactor markers. An important group of organic acids are the neurotransmitter metabolites. These are breakdown products of neurotransmitter metabolism. Catecholamine metabolism begins with the amino acid tyrosine. Tyrosine converts into dopamine. Dopamine is methylated and converted into homovanillate. Elevated homovanillate may indicate dopamine turnover seen in mood disorders. Patients with sleep apnea can have high urinary dopamine metabolite levels. Dopamine also creates norepinephrine, leading to the production of epinephrine. Norepinephrine leads to the production of vanyl mendelate. Elevated urinary vanyl mendelate correlates to physiologic stress conditions. Let's take a look at serotonin metabolism. In serotonin metabolism, the amino acid tryptophan converts into 5-hydroxytryptophan. 5-hydroxytryptophan is often given to patients to help them sleep. 5-hydroxytryptophan converts into serotonin, predominantly in the gut. In fact, 95% of serotonin is made in the gut. Some of the serotonin is methylated into melatonin. Serotonin also converts into 5-hydroxyindolacetate. Since 95% of serotonin is from GI production, elevation of 5-hydroxyindolacetate has been linked with irritable bowel syndrome, especially with constipation. Lower levels have been more associated with IBS and rapid transit time. Patients supplementing with tryptophan or 5-hydroxytryptophan or utilizing SSRIs may also see elevated levels of 5-hydroxyindolacetate. Sometimes tryptophan goes down a different pathway. Under certain stresses, it may instead go to the production of kynurinate. This happens with high cortisol, inflammation, high estradiol. Kynurinate tends to be protective, and elevations may also speak to a need for B6 specifically. However, if kynurinate converts into quinolinate in high concentrations, that can be a greater problem because quinolinate is a known neurotoxin. It leads to systemic inflammation and an excitatory process as far as the central nervous system. In addition, tryptophan is metabolized or detoxified in the liver to make picolinate. Elevations of picolinate are associated with systemic inflammation. We also have oxidative damage and antioxidant markers on this page. P-hydroxyphenolactate can speak to intestinal pathology, dysbiosis, or a history of antibiotic use and is known to deplete vitamin C. So an elevation of P-hydroxyphenolactate is strongly associated with the need for vitamin C supplementation. 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, or 8-OHDG for short, is an oxidative stress measurement. Elevations speak to measurable oxidative stress damage. Stress damage in the cell nucleus where free radicals create DNA damage, thus the guanosine, as you may recall, 
which is a base of DNA molecules. Some organic acids relate to toxic exposure and detoxification capacity. 2-methylhyporate is a breakdown product of xylene, most commonly through volatile organic compounds from paints, varnishes, as well as pesticide exposure. Orotate has been used to assess arginine status and urea cycle dysfunction. Glucarate is frequently used as a marker for phase one detoxification of pesticides and xenobiotics. Patients using calcium deglucarate therapy may see a rise in this marker. Alpha hydroxybutyrate is hypothesized to be a marker for upregulation of the transsulfuration pathway, which produces glutathione. The majority of the literature demonstrates a correlation with dysglycemia. Pyroglutamate elevations suggest nutrient support for glutathione precursors. Pyroglutamate is a precursor and breakdown product of glutathione. Urinary sulfate has been used to assess detoxification capacity, though dietary intake can influence this finding. Let's take a look at the gut. Here are the compounds of bacteria or yeast fungal origin. Several organic acids are produced by gut bacterial fermentation. In other words, various nutrients in your gut, such as uh, protein amino acids, uh, other nutrients such as green tea extract are going to be acted upon by the bacteria in your gut. It will ferment the nutrient and create these organic acids. And so we're making assumptions based on these levels because they can reflect gut bacterial activity. Antibiotic use has been correlated with decreased excretion of bacterial organic acids. It'll lower, it being antibiotic use, would lower the bacteria available to make these changes. Dietary habits can strongly influence urine levels of organic acids. So when you look at some of these, such as phenylacetate, number 38 here, it begins as phenylalanine, an amino acid. So if your diet includes a great deal of protein, if you're on a paleo diet, you're likely to have higher concentrations of phenylacetate. Stool analysis provides fuller insight into the gut microbiota. Your gold standard will be the stool analysis. We recommend the GIFX 2200. Diarabinitol is actually not an organic acid. It's got that OL ending that tells us we're dealing with an alcohol. There is some indication in the literature that an elevation of diarabinitol can be indicative of a higher level of yeast, specifically candida. Now it's time for a case study review. Our case study involves a 32-year-old female. Her chief complaint, fatigue for two years. She had a normal CBC, thyroid, and iron level. A review of systems showed constipation and occasional loose stools. She's been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, by her primary doctor. There's an abundance of processed foods in her diet no medications or dietary supplements. She drinks a few glasses of wine per night and stays up very late and eats her biggest meal at night and she skips breakfast. The summary of abnormal findings begin with the fatty acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, and energy production markers. Remember what we're looking at here is the Krebs cycle, the production of energy. And we're also looking at the macronutrients that fuel that, fatty acids oxidizing, a borderline high suberate tells us that she's having difficulty utilizing fats as a form of energy production, as fuel. Carbohydrate metabolism is showing a borderline high L-lactate. Glycolysis involves the production of L-lactate and pyruvate. In this case, a borderline high L-lactate makes one suspicious because oxygenation can be a problem when you elevate L-lactate. It may be sleep apnea. It may be some sort of um, asthma issue with oxygenation. Also a need for zinc. 
The beta hydroxybutyrate is borderline high. It says here under metabolic pathway ketone production. Beta hydroxybutyrate is a ketone that we're finding in the urine. Why a high ketone? Is she catabolic? Is she on a low carb diet? Is she on a uh, high fat diet, a ketogenic diet? Is she diabetic? Those are questions worth asking. None of that showed up in her case study. However, in the history, the fact that she's not sleeping does make me suspicious. Maybe she should be evaluated for sleep apnea. The energy production markers are from the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, borderline high for citrate, cisaconidate, isocitrate, fumarate. So this may also indicate a need for B vitamin support in order to drive that cycle. Perhaps the need for CoQ10, magnesium. There are other cofactors. Uh, sometimes toxicity can lead to elevations within the citric acid cycle. The B-complex markers provide a borderline high alpha keto beta methylvalerate. Xantharanate is high. Beta hydroxy isovalerate are high. These are all specific B vitamin needs. The neurotransmitter metabolism markers show us a borderline high 5-hydroxy indole acetate. As you may recall, 5-hydroxy indole acetate is a byproduct of serotonin predominantly in the gut. Elevations do speak to the possibility of IBS. Kynurinate was high. That's a stress marker where tryptophan makes kynurinate as a result of perhaps high cortisol, inflammation, and the need for B6. P-hydroxyphenolactate was elevated as well. This is a gut bacterial metabolism metabolic pathway as indicated. Remember, it also drains vitamin C. And so this would speak to a high need for vitamin C supplementation, as well as uh, correlate to her IBS diagnosis. The pyroglutamate and sulfate are borderline high, all part of the glutathione pathway. Pyroglutamate, a breakdown product of glutathione, may indicate that she's burning through glutathione. A high sulfate may be from diet, but also reveals possible issues with this transsulfuration pathway. Homocysteine goes down the transsulfuration pathway and eventually does produce glutathione. When we look at the gut, we see elevations of phenylacetate, p-hydroxybenzoate, a borderline high p-hydroxyphenylacetate, a high, uh, borderline high D-lactate. So these indicate possible gut bacterial metabolism issues. Here's how it actually looks on the test. Remember, these are the nutrient markers for fatty acid metabolism. We just reviewed these in the systems, but the carnitine and B2 are a response to the high suberate. Here's the L-lactate, which was an indication of possible oxygenation issues, perhaps sleep apnea, perhaps asthma. Beta hydroxybutyrate, the ketone body I described earlier. And here are the citric acid cycle elevations. You can see B complex, CoQ10 amino acids, and magnesium all indicated. The B vitamin findings for B complex needs. Alpha keto beta methylvalerate would speak to a need for B1, 2, 3, and 5. Xantharanate specific to B6 need. Beta hydroxy isovalerate to the need for biotin. Toxicants and detoxification. There is that pyroglutamate and sulfate. Again, glutathione need and transsulfuration. Detoxification needs. And what about the gut? we saw on the front page that there were a number of these elevations. Now these organic acids can suggest dysbiosis but can be influenced by diet. But based on what she describes of her diet of processed foods, I'd be surprised if uh, high levels of amino acids and fruits, uh, grapes, uh, green tea extract, the kinds of uh, precursors to these organic acids are really the problem here. This is more likely related to her IBS and gut issues.
The final page of the Organics Comprehensive Profile provides us with recommendations. You see on the left various nutrients, starting with vitamin C, uh, that are indicated by the algorithm as far as need. The nutrient need, the center column, tells us the algorithm's rating. Was there an optional, low need basically, a moderate need, a high need? And then the various ranges that one could look at. This is the opportunity for the clinician who sees the patient one-on-one -on -one to indicate what the recommendation should be and list on the right under clinical or clinician recommendations. So remember the vitamin C recommendation, which is high here, and partially because of our p-hydroxyphenolactate elevation that we described earlier. So assuming a high need, the doctor would look at the range, 1,000 to 2,000 in terms of nutrient supplementation for vitamin C. In this case, one might want to go closer to the 2,000 high end. So one would also go through the various listings on this page and write down their recommendations on the right. Recall the chief complaint was fatigue, and here's a patient that's getting very little sleep, we saw a number of Krebs cycle needs around B complex that should certainly be taken into consideration. We saw gut needs and a diagnosis of IBS. So the gut becomes an important player here as far as a treatment uh, a protocol design. Also the abundance of processed foods. One would think about perhaps more of a Mediterranean style diet, a more balanced diet, less processed, more vitamins and minerals made available and she drank a few glasses of wine per night and stays up late. It's really difficult to get better if you're not getting sleep. Also recall the high L-lactate and the possibility of sleep apnea, something worth following up on. I would certainly want to see a GIFX comprehensive stool to get a better sense of what's going on in the gut for this patient. So the physician would go through this list and add on the clinician recommendations what they feel would be best for the patient based on the presentation as well as the findings on the test. Additional testing considerations, as I said earlier, the gut is a big player here, the GIFX comprehensive and or the IgG food antibody testing. Consider checking cortisol levels with the adrenal cortex stress profile and cortisol awakening response or CAR. The organics is a subset of the larger ion profile, which provides additional details on amino acids, fatty acids, nutrient and toxic elements, and homocysteine. More data would be helpful for this patient, but we certainly have a great deal to go on based on this test. Questions? Explore our website, www.gdx.net. Thank you so much for listening.